So I'm very happy to be discussing today, treating advanced PAD in a complex environment. Certainly everything that we're doing in healthcare is centered on either keeping the patient out of the hospital or getting really safe treatments. And I'm really happy today to review the current data and treatment algorithms to prevent reintervention. I'm really happy to have this discussion with my two participants that are also really good friends. Dr. Pete Schneider is being talked to us from Hawaii. Uh, we all wish we were there, that's for sure. And Dr. John Laird is gonna be doing his discussion from California. These are colleagues that have been around a long time and are some of the best experts in their field around. So this program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical, Medical Education, an HMP company. And importantly, it's supported by an educational grant from Medtronic. The objectives today are to understand the current clinical landscape for superficial femoral artery interventions, understand the long-term safety and efficacy of drug-coated balloons, identify an appropriate course of treatment and device selection based on new available data, and compare the clinical outcomes of provisional studying after drug-coated balloon therapy. When we're talking about the FEMPOP region, we know it's very complex because there's lots of different technology. And this is a very nice overview of where we are with the device landscape. If you look at the left, the bottom zero zero is no patency and no length. And as we go out to the right, we see longer lesions and we see patency from 100% down to 0%. And so as we've seen, most of the early trials were short lesions and short patency. Now we've gotten a lot of data on long complex lesions with drug-coated balloon therapy, as you'll notice in the blue dots, secondary to the Medtronic Impact Admiral data set. Well, at this time of treatment of COVID-19, we're really trying to keep patients out of the hospital. It's really important to try to use any intervention that will re reduce the need for repeat interventions. And as we see, the impact to Admiral DCB had a 73% reduction in, in one year reintervention rate. So, this is a good strategy to try to keep your patients out of the hospital, even with complex superficial femoral disease. This is the first time data release of the impact global four year outcomes for stented versus non-stented lesions, a very important data set. So the background to this is complex disease. We know what gets into ID trials. It's simple lesions, really not usually you know, very complex, but real world lesions are certainly much more complex. So we know that bare metal stents outdid angioplasty uh, with a much better patency at one year. And if you look at that, the longer the lesion length, there was a particular of lower patency, 35 to 65%, and there was an associated higher stent fracture rate, which we don't know what to make a lot of, but it's still probably not good. The clinical evidence of real-world drug-coated balloon studies has expanded. Bailout stents, however, are still oftentimes needed in complex lesions. As previously reported, the IMPACT Global Study outcomes elucidated the IMPACT Admiral DCB can be safely followed by provisional bare metal stents with sustained freedom from clinically driven TLR through three years. Now let's look at the IMPACT Global Study as an overview just to see where did we get these patients from. So this is a real world prospective, multi-center, single arm, independently adjudicated femoropoptil study. It originally had 1,535 patients enrolled at 64 sites in, across the world except for the United States. There was independent adjudication by Clinical Events Committee for certain subsets. And this was a prospective subset analysis with core lab reported results for de novo and stent restenosis, long lesions greater than 15 centimeters, and CTOs that were greater than 5 centimeters. And then we also looked at safety and effectiveness data on 150 millimeter drug coated balloon subset. So these were complex lesions. They had bilateral disease, multiple lesions, lesions that involve both the SFA and popliteal. They are across the task from A, simple, to D, very complex. They had early critical limb ischemia in Rutherford class two through four, and it had de novo instant restenosis, long lesions, and CTOs. So we started with 1,535 subjects are enrolled. We're gonna set aside the 150 millimeter DCB cohort and look at the 1,416 subjects. 
and this included de novo and stent restenosis, longer lesions, and CTOs. The key inclusion criteria, oftentimes ones that aren't in those early IDE studies. So this, again, had some critical limb ischemia, so sort of class two, three, and even four. Lesions in the SFA or popliteal artery could be single or multiple uh, stenoses, but they had to be greater than two centimeters. Again, it could be de novo or restenotic, including instant restenosis, and they had to have one vessel runoff. Now, exclusion was more people that had wounds, growth through class five and six, if there was acute or subacute thrombus, previous bypass surgery to the target lesion, or failure to cross the target lesion with a guide wire, and actually, you just couldn't do the procedure. So again, this was blinded, independently assessed outcomes. Uh, the primary efficacy endpoint was freedom from clinically driven TLR within 12 months, with a primary safety endpoint of freedom from device and procedure-related death through 30 days, and freedom from target limb major amputation or clinically driven TBR. So if we look at this, Impact Global, we had 353 stented subjects we could compare to a little over 1,000 non-stented subjects. In other words, for this complex lesion subset, we had about a 25% provisional stent rate. If you look for the reason for provisional stenting in those 455 lesions, again, 353 patients, but 455 lesions, about 60% had a residual stenosis of greater than 50%, which we see very commonly. A half percent, and not too many, had a greater than 10 millimeter translesion grading as the reason from the investigator. As we might see in real world, flow limiting dissection in about 54%, or for some other reason that the investigator thought they needed to put a stent in. If you look at the baseline characteristics and compare the stented group versus a non stented group, they're very similar except for carotid artery disease was more common in the non-stented group. You can see that previous peripheral revascularization was more common in the non-stented group, and the ABI was lower in the stented group, as you might expect for more complex disease. But the rest of it was typically what we see in these type of trials with a lot of smokers, diabetes, hypertension. Now, if we look at the baseline respiratory class, you can see that there were about 30% in each group in class two, about 60% in class three, and about seven to nine percent in class four. And unlike the protocol, which you didn't call, there were a few patients that actually got in with respiratory class five. Baseline lesion characteristics are exactly what you might see. Lesion length was more complex in the stented group. Total occlusions were more common in the stented group. Occluded lesion length was higher in the stented group. Calcification was listed as severe, more likely in the stented group. Diameter stenosis was higher in the stented group. And the reference vessel diameter was the same in both groups. So just more complex disease, but similar size vessel. This just gives you a, a typical, more visual look at this. You can see again, more CTOs in the stented group, more severe calcification, and a little bit more severe diameter stenosis in this complex disease pattern. If you look at the procedural characteristics, you can see high success in both groups and no difference. Procedural success was a little higher in the non-stented group as you expect for the more complex disease process. Uh, if you look at uh, clinical success, you can see that it was a little higher in the non-stented group because of, again, more simple lesions. But if you look at pre-dilation, more common in the stented group because these were more complex, and calcification, those kind of things. And post-dilation was more common as well. Again, if you look at the dissections, you can see the dissections that you saw because these were a complex group, thus leading to the stenting. If you look at stent coverage, some of these were spots, some are partial, and some are whole lesion uh, coverage. And you can see the divisions right there. Now, here's what you wanted to know. How effective is is it if you have to add a stent to a complex disease process, how does that compare to the simple lesions that just got drug coated balloon? And what you'll see is p-value 0.152, no difference at four years. This is unbelievable and a great data set. So now we know if we need to optimize a drug coated balloon complex disease angioplasty to get good treatment, increase your MLD, get rid of the dissection, those kind of things, that it does not appear that stenting decreases the patency and the patency is what you'd see in the more optimal balloon angioplasty group. 
Additional effectiveness outcomes through four years. If you look at any TLR, there was no difference between the uh, two groups. And if you look at time to first repeat revascularization, there was no difference between the two groups. But what I want you to notice in both groups is that it's over a year and a half. So this is excellent. These patients are getting good clinical results uh, from both technologies, whether you needed to use drug coated balloon and a adjunctive stent or just had an optimal balloon angioplasty result and could just use a drug coated balloon. If you look at the safety outcomes, no difference in between the two groups. So we're not seeing any downside right now of placing the stent in to optimize your result from a complex disease process. These are additional safety outcomes through four years. If you look at any major adverse event, no difference between the two. All-cause death was very similar between the two, and what you'd expect, and actually maybe lower than what we would expect for the natural history of this disease process at four years. If you look at clinically driven uh, total vascular revascularization, you see no difference. Major target limb amputation was low in both groups, and thrombosis was very low in both groups at four years. So these are excellent additional safety outcomes. So in summary, if you look at stinted versus non-stinted analysis, kind of optimal drug-coated balloon versus complex drug-coated balloon optimized with stents. And this com complex lesion subset, the, um, the DCB demonstrated durable safety and effectiveness through four years. In the event of a suboptimal angioplast result, persistent residual stenosis, flow limiting dissection, the impact admiral drug-coated balloon can be safely followed by a provisional bare metal stent with the expectation of similar outcomes through four years compared to the optimal angioplasty with drug coated balloon alone. So Gary, I'll ask uh, this question. Uh, with regards to the stenting that was done, you said this nice even mix of spot stenting versus partial le lesion coverage versus full uh, lesion coverage. Was there any use of a uh, uh, tacking device as part of this uh, registry? This as a method for dealing with dissection? Wow, really good question, John. Um, that this, this was done actually prior to the release of the TAC device. So these were all uh, the typical bare metal, uh, bare metal nitinol stents. We don't know what portion of these might have been Supira. We don't have that broken down yet. Good question. And what about uh, the use of uh, a drug eluding stent versus a bare metal stent after uh, use of uh, drug coated balloons. Do you have any kind of feelings about that? Sort of a double dose of paclitaxel? Yeah, I have a personal feeling about it. Certainly it wasn't done in this trial. You know, we, we know that paclitaxel has a you know, very tight um, safety profile. So right now, until we know better, I probably would not go down that road. I, I think um, that was a good question. Uh, people want to know about things like that. Um, and I agree with you. I, I don't think I would uh, recommend a double dose either. And it's not on any of the IFUs, of course. I was just going to comment, Gary. It, it seems that the data you're presenting, and I know you were very much involved in the Impact Global. I mean, it's a large data set. It's well done. It seems like it's telling us that if you're there at the procedure table, you're doing a case, you see a dissection you're concerned about, that it's okay to treat it. In other words, that adding stent in this situation or, or putting a scaffold there does not diminish what you can expect in terms of results. And, and actually, if you just think about the fact of how many more occlusions there were in the stented group and how the lesions were longer, I would have honestly expected a, a wider diversion between the, the curves between those two groups. And were you a little bit surprised how well the how well the stented group did given that the lesions were longer and there were so many more occlusions? Yeah, I was really surprised, Steve. Uh, Steve. Pete. Um, you know, it's one of those things where when you look at that, you do think because of the CTOs, you would have had a lesser outcome. And it, it was amazing to me, actually, both at two years and then again at four years, that those outcomes are very stable between the two groups and similar to the optimal angioplasty. And I think what it tells you is that. With the advent of drugs, you're trying to get the best upfront luminal gain that you can and get a stable result. That makes sense. I like that. 
And next, I'll ask that Dr. Peter Schneider present on the safety of drug-coated balloons. Pete? Great. Th thank you, Gary. Um, as we know, safety of drug-coated balloons has been an issue over the past 18 months. And uh, in December of 2018, we saw the publication of a meta-analysis looking at the randomized controlled trials. So this was a summary level study of the um, randomized controlled trials of paclitaxel versus non-coded devices that had gone out to uh, five years. And this meta-analysis on the basis of um, primarily analyzing publications had suggested that at five years, there was a relative risk of 1.93 between those who had paclitaxel and those who did not in the randomized controlled trials. So this of course is a very important issue and uh, if uh, somehow we are doing harm to our patients, uh, we need to know about it as soon as we can and, uh, and try to mitigate that problem. The flip side is we also know that drug-coated balloons are one of the most important advances in um, improved patency in the past 20 to 30 years uh, and treating peripheral vascular disease patients. So quite a uh, dilemma of, um, that has to be sorted through. So several things have been done to help us understand the safety of DCBs since then. So I'm gonna present some of that data uh, briefly. And this is uh, some information that was presented at the FDA panel, which met in June of 2019. And at that time, the pooled uh, data from the impact IDE study, which was the uh, uh, accumulated data from the US uh, and also Europe for the impact IDE combined with the Japan IDE trials or Japan approval trials. And with that data pooled, we can see freedom from CDTLR between uh, impact DCB and PTA. The mortality risk of paclitaxel. So there are several things about these randomized controlled trials. They were powered for one year patency, not long-term mortality. The control groups in many of the studies were quite small and they were randomized in a two to one fashion. Uh, again, without a um, sense at that time that there would be an associated mortality signal that had to be better understood. And questions arose, was there the potential for ascertainment bias? And the other issue was, were both groups treated the same? Yes, it's a randomized trial, and we think of randomized trials as the holy grail, but that doesn't guarantee that throughout the life of the study, over the course of the ensuing five years, that those groups would be treated exactly equally. The reason why these issues are important is because we need to know is the mortality risk that's been questioned, is it a causal relationship or merely an association? So one of the ways that we understand whether it's a causal relationship is to ask the question, is there a dose response or a biological gradient? If it's a dangerous material, then a larger amount should have a stronger effect than a smaller amount of material. The next question, is there a clustering of deaths, which would suggest mechanism? If there's no clustering of deaths, it's hard to connect then the potential for an, a, an agent, if it has a toxicity, to uh, a particular outcome. Is the danger consistent? That is, if it is a dangerous material, well, it should be equally dangerous in, in different settings, different geographies, for example. And this, again, is to help us answer the question, is this a causal relationship or an association? These are the so-called Bradford Hill criteria, which is um, how one would go about associating or at least understanding whether the relationships, relationship between an, a particular uh, agent or event and an outcome is a causal relationship or an association. So probably the the most straightforward of these to look uh, to analyze initially is this issue of potential for dose response or a biological gradient. Now, part of the uh, summary level meta-analysis that, that uh, questioned the safety uh, on the basis of mortality 
part of the um, analysis was this concept of a dose equation. And this was uh, the assumption that there was a continuous linear and increasing exposure over time because you can see that the exposure was calculated as dose times time. And of course, we know that uh, advanced age and uh, years in follow-up is also associated with mortality because time is disproportionately available for studies with longer term follow-up. So this equation was made up. Um, I mean, assumptions went into this. And I think we really have to question this because the longer you follow someone, the older the patient, the higher the likelihood of a mortality event. That I think is common sense. So the FDA did a <clears throat> device by device analysis of a dose effect on mortality and could find none. And this is their analysis. Subsequent to that, uh, looking at 1,837 DCB patients in the IMPACT program, we looked at the higher dose, the mid dose, and the lower dose. And you can see that there was no significant difference between the group. And in fact, the highest dose had the lowest mortality um, in this group. Subsequent to that, in the pooled IMPACT IDE and Japan trials, a similar type of outcome with no relationship between dose and mortality going out to five years. And this was also presented at the um, FDA panel in June 2019. So when the FDA issued their letter in August of 2019 advising physicians on how to manage this uh, as yet unclear situation, the FDA said, no clear evidence of a paclitaxel dose effect on mortality and no identified pathophysiologic mechanism for late deaths. Subsequent to that, there was another patient level and meta-analysis uh, by Viva, which again showed no dose effect. In fact, the, um, the uh, uh, medium dose had actually the least effect on mortality. Again, no dose effect uh, associated with uh, paclitaxel and mortality. So the other uh, issue that we mentioned before is that there was no uh, apparent clustering of deaths. So using the so-called Hicks method, which is to separate mortalities into cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular deaths, what we see in the randomized trials is an, an increase in mortality in the DCB group, but it's diffuse, it's across all settings. Uh, suggesting that there is no specificity here. There is no um, uh, mechanism of action related to the paclitaxel that would uh, specifically cause one thing, one event uh, more like to have one event more likely to occur than another. So again, no clustering of deaths, no treatment comparisons were significant. So one of the um, other things that was, I think, important to do is to look at the non- uh, mortality, potential paclitaxel-related adverse events, which had previously been reported. And those include the, some of those listed here, neurotoxicity, as well as several hematological negative events, as well as myalgia. And what we saw is that there was no difference uh, between the paclitaxel and, and the non-paclitaxel group with respect to non um, or with respect to non-mortality events or adverse events that have been reported to be related to paclitaxel in previous studies. Another issue with the randomized controlled trials specifically is that there were a tremendous number of patients lost to follow-up. And you can see there in the, um, uh, in the First column labeled pre-FDA panel, you can see that the percentage of patients in each group lost follow-up was significant, up to 38.3% in the Zilver PTX group. After a thorough search, um, which occurred after the panel, you can see that the number of missing patients went down significantly and that uh, anywhere from 20% to 86% of the missing patients were located. And so what happened when the missing patients were located? Well, this is the FDA analysis of patient level data, looking at the five-year point estimate uh, from the FDA before 
a search for these uh, patients' vital status was undertaken. And what you see is that the relative risk of paclitaxel versus no paclitaxel is 1.72. After vital status ascertainment, it was 1.57, or a decrease of 21%. In the pooled IDE and Japan studies, when this vital status ascertainment was undertaken, the uh, absolute difference in mortality risk between DCB and PTA decreased from 4% to 2.7% after vital status ascertainment. So the hazard ratio decreased from 1.63 to 1.39, or a decrease of 38%. So well, what does this mean? And my sense is that because the patients were randomized on their way into the trial, it doesn't guarantee that they will be uh, uh, followed or that they will drop out in a randomized fashion. And in fact, it appears that there was ascertainment bias in the sense that the patients uh, did become either uh, lost to follow up or withdraw in a biased manner, suggesting that the more patients we find, the more the hazard ratio uh, decreases. It's not the complete answer, but it's a part of the answer of why these are so different. Another issue I mes mentioned is consistency. If it is a dangerous and toxic substance, it should be uh, relatively consistent in its toxicity. But what you see here is um, on the left-hand side of the slide, you see that when you break down the impact SFA study, which was the IDE study for the U.S., and you compare the patients treated in the United States versus the patients treated outside the United States, that the freedom from all-cause mortality was significantly different in the United States, but not outside the United States. In other words, you can see in the visual difference between those two curves that the U.S. and the OUS situation was quite different. Similar activity in Levant II, which was also an IDE study looking at U.S. patients versus OUS patients, and you can see that the mortality difference was substantially different in the U.S. than outside the U.S. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see the impact Japan data. Um, and this is three-year data rather than five-year. But you also can see that the mortality was actually higher in the PTA group and that there really was no difference between the two groups. So why would it be more dangerous in one geography than another? Well, it says to me something more related to the trial itself or the trial design rather than the particular um, agent. So what about the trial design? Well, here's another way in which the, the trials may have been conducted a little bit differently in different geographies. So you can see here that the, um, that the brown bars are uh, representing the PTA patients and the red bars are representing the DCB patients. And you can see that pretty consistently across all time frames and all geographies, US, Europe, and Japan, that the PTA patients were more likely to show up for follow-up or to be compliant with visit attendance during their follow-up. Um, and, and so it would suggest that the PTA patients might have had actually a little bit better follow-up. and um, But you also can see that in the United States, that difference was greater than it was in Europe, where the difference was small, or the difference in Japan, where the difference was even smaller. And this is suggesting to me that there may have been some treatment group differences that are as yet poorly characterized and may not be possible to completely characterize. But at the same time, there were differences. I don't think we can ignore this, especially when some of these mortality differences appear not to be causal, but more an association and more related to the randomized trials than to the real world data, which has developed subsequently. So that brings me to the real world data, which I think, you know, as patients are increasingly um, having their health records digitized and uh, transportable, storable and searchable. Um, and this is a, a phenomenon happening across the world. Uh, this the, the importance of real-world data and our ability to look back for something we didn't expect or suspect at the time and to look back and see if it were true. So what you see on the left-hand side of this slide, again, this was also uh, presented at the FDA panel in June of 2019 or, or, or a variation of this. This is an updated version. But 
On the left-hand side of the panel, you can see the pooled randomized controlled trial analysis, which was 2,185 patients. And you can see that the initial meta, uh, meta-analysis from Journal of American Heart Association showed a uh, relative risk of 1.93 between paclitaxel and non-paclitaxel. The FDA did their analysis and came up with 1.72, but subsequent to the um, ascertainment or the location of additional vital status data on not all, but many of the patients, it went down to 1.57. The VIVA uh, analysis uh, was done looking at randomized controlled trials, but it also broadened the scope a little bit of the randomized controlled trials. Um, And they did it by including randomized controlled trials of the exact same devices, but those that some of which were performed outside the United States. And with that, the relative risk then was 1.27. Again, taking account for some of that geographic variation or that lack of consistency of the mortality signal across geographies. And then comes the real world data. And you can see the hazard ratios from the real world data are really different than the hazard ratios from the randomized controlled trials. And uh, also evident there is, whereas there were a little over 2,000 patients in the randomized controlled trials out to four and five years, um, now with the use of the Medicare database, as well as private insurance databases and the uh, vascular quality initiative, that uh, across that entire group, you're over 200,000 patients. Uh, Again, many times larger group. And with that, whether it's inpatient or outpatient, whether it's uh, drug eluding stent or drug coated balloon, whether it's claudication or critical limb, um, and I'm not gonna go into the uh, subsets of each of those, but there is no identifiable um, increase in mortality related to paclitaxel across a massive amount of real world data. Again, suggesting to me that it has something to do with trial design, specifically of the randomized controlled trials. So why can't we find the signal in real world data? Well, Honestly, if there is a causal relationship, it would be impossible to hide it in 200,000 patients. This, I think, is why the FDA said some very specific things in their updated letter to physicians in August of 2017, uh, I'm sorry, August 7 of 2019, that the uh, FDA agreed uh, with the panel that the magnitude of the signal should be interpreted with caution because of multiple limitations of available data and also no clear evidence of a dose effect, no identified uh, pathophysiologic mechanism for late deaths. For individuals judged to be particularly at high risk for restenosis and repeat femoral popliteal interventions, clinicians may determine that the benefits of using a paclitaxel coated device outweigh the risk of mortality. So the FDA then included this language in their letter, which I think is important because they're speaking directly now to physicians and and how we should manage our practices and what we should do. So when I think of those at particularly high risk for intervention uh, or for re-intervention, I think of managing patients with occlusions. I think of uh, long lesions like uh, this patient that had a recanalization of a task D lesion with reconstitution of the above knee pop or even longer lesions, uh, which is now, this is much longer than the um, initial barrier of a TASC-D lesion. This is more like a 35 centimeter lesion. I think of um, patients with complex lesions, those with instant restenosis. Also multi-level disease, which includes uh, disease at, at several different locations that have to be treated in order to revascularize a limb. I think of patients with uh, popliteal disease. And I also think of those patients who, um, in addition to having a long occlusion, they also have a disease reentry site or uh, other levels of disease. And of course, um, those patients that have, along with their complex uh, morphological occlusive disease, they have uh, critical limb ischemia or chronic limb threatening ischemia that, um, that 
puts the limb in the balance. So in conclusion, the mortality signal that was identified is there in the randomized controlled trials, but the better we understand what took place in the randomized controlled trials, the smaller the signal uh, appears to be and the more variable it appears to be. And the most recent VIVA analysis of patient level data showed a 1.27 hazard ratio. The magnitude of the signal should be interpreted with caution, as we mentioned, direct from the FDA. There was no mortality signal in real world data. Subsequent to um, some of that uh, Medicare, VQI, and Optum data, there have been now database uh, minings from around the world, including uh, several from Germany and other large nat national uh, health databases, which have continued to support the lack of a mortality signal. So I, in my practice, consider drug coated balloons in patients, particularly at uh, high risk for restenosis and repeat femoral popliteal interventions. Well, thanks uh, very much for that, uh, Peter. That was a great uh, overview. And uh, you've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about this paclitaxel safety issue and have done a lot of work trying to understand it better. And we, we thank you for that important work. I guess my question to you is, uh, what do you see as the next important uh, data set that will uh, shine further light on this issue uh, regarding safety. Is there anything coming in the near future that you think will uh, uh, shed some important uh, light on things? Yeah, great question, John. I, there, there are some important data sets and some that I know the FDA is highly interested in. Uh, one is the Illuminate five-year data. Um, as you know, that is uh, one of our approved DCBs in the U.S., uh, we've seen their three-year data that was presented at the FDA panel. And uh, this is a prospective randomized controlled trial. It's sizable. It's also uh, performed in the U.S. and uh, with sites outside the U.S. And that five-year data will be helpful because it would substantially increase the five-year RCT data. In addition to that, we have the Voyager trial, um, which is not a randomized trial from a standpoint of paclitaxel versus non-paclitaxel devices, but it's a large trial. It's in these patients, and many of the patients uh, did receive uh, paclitaxel-coded devices. So a sub-analysis or reanalysis of the Voyager data, I'm imagining would be helpful. Um, there are a couple other quick things. One is that um, we know that the um, uh, Illuvia versus Zilver, the Imperial trial, uh, has been reported out to two years. Although that's paclitaxel versus paclitaxel, that will continue to yield follow-up. The Transcend trial, which again is two drug-coated balloons, but um, uh, that will uh, yield uh, several year data at some point. And then lastly, I'll just say um, that all of these real-world databases, I showed you VQI, Medicare, Optum, et cetera, they will continue to accrue follow-up uh, and continue to accrue additional years uh, on the, those same patients or potentially an even larger group of patients that I think will also be helpful to, to make sure that we're not missing something else uh, hidden in this information. Hey, I know that also there'll be some randomized data coming from the SwedePad trial, which is a fairly large randomized study in Sweden looking at Paclitaxel eluding versus non-paclitaxel eluding therapies, and uh, hopefully that will also help uh, provide some clarity with regards to this issue. Agreed, agreed. And one thing I don't know about SweetPad is whether there will be interim analyses presented because it, it is still enrolling. Um, my sense is that because they stopped trial enrollment when this issue was first announced and people were worried about it, they did some type of analysis, which did, they did not make public, that allowed them to resume trial enrollment. Um, but whether they'll give us interim data is not clear. I don't know actually if they've even decided because I haven't heard one way or the other. Pete, one of the things that I've always found interesting is how do we bring in the patient in this discussion to help with his decision? I mean, we, we act like we're the, you know, the, we're going to use it or not going to use it, but the patient should have some input, I at least think. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's essential, actually. Uh, and um, I think one thing that came clear at the panel was uh, 
that, um, I mean, if, well, let's just say the, um, you know, the patient advocates on the panel felt strongly that patients should participate in this decision. Um, and like so many things in medicine, we don't actually know all the answers. And so uh, at the very least, this issue has to be presented to the patient. What I find is that, um, is that most patients are readily accepting of what seems like even a complex discussion. Um, they do want to know about it. Uh, once in a while, I'll have a patient that just says, you know, doc, forget it. I, I just, I don't want to have to worry about that. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to participate in that. But most patients are not like that. Uh, at least in, in, for me, it has, it has been, you know, that a good, a robust discussion is a reasonable thing uh, to have and to have it up front because sometimes going into a case, you don't know if you're going to use uh, drug coded or drug delivering devices or not. So I typically have it each time. And if somebody says, hey, forget it, uh, I don't want to have that, then I let, let it go. Yeah, I find that important as well, isn't that? Especially when you look at most of the randomized trials, we're looking at focal lesions. When we look at the longer lesions where the patients are really at risk for a lot of repeat procedures, they need to be brought into that discussion. Good, good job. Right. What a great presentation, great questions. Our next presenter is a good friend of mine, Dr. John Laird from St. Helena, California, who's going to be talking about stenting versus non-stenting in the SFA, a review of current data and cases. John? And so I'd like to start uh, with a very brief review of the IMPACT SFA trial. Uh, Peter and I and Gunnar Tepe were co-PIs for this trial. It took place in two phases first uh, phase in Europe and the second phase in the United States, ultimately randomizing patients two to one between drug crota balloon angioplasty and plain old balloon angioplasty. We had a patency data out to three years with independent and blinded duplex ultrasound core lab, and then clinical data out to five years. What we saw was a significant benefit at three years with regards, regards to primary patency, 69.5% in the DCB arm of the trial compared to 45.1% in the balloon angioplasty arm of the trial. And then out to five years, it was still significant benefit with regards to freedom from clinically driven target lesion revascularization 74.5% compared to 65.3%. With that very brief introduction, I wanted to present a case which I think highlights uh, many of the things that we've talked about already today. This is a 68-year-old uh, woman with a history of uh, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, a heavy smoking history. She had quit two years previous. And she presented with symptoms of two-block claudication, which had been progressive and now significantly lifestyle limiting for her. Her right ABI was mildly redu reduced, and her left ABI was moderately reduced. And by duplex ultrasound, she had evidence of left SFA occlusion. This is a patient that actually I just treated a few weeks ago after we started uh, opening things up to sort of elective or semi-elective uh, cases in the cath lab. And you can see her aortogram, which shows uh, somewhat difficult aortiliac bifurcation uh, with some slower flow down the right iliac artery. And I think you can appreciate a, a fairly focal high-grade stenosis in the distal right external iliac artery. Uh, and flow impacted by the catheter being across that area of stenosis. Then as we look at the left lower extremity angiogram, we see some complex disease uh, in the proximal SFA with a relatively long occlusion in the mid to distal SFA. There's reconstitution of the proximal popliteal artery uh, via collaterals. And then downstream from there, actually things look pretty good. The P2 and P3 segments of the popliteal artery are widely patent. And there's uh, 
three vessel runoff uh, below the knee. So a lot of things to talk about with a case like this. I think based on Peter's discussion, I would consider this patient a higher risk patient for restenosis. She's diabetic, got long SFA lesion with total occlusion. You could talk about what your technique would be for crossing the CTO, whether you to use just standard guide wire techniques or a dedicated CTO device, whether to use a debulking uh, device in a case like this, whether we should use embolic protection. And, you know, in this era of uh, COVID-19, should we approach it differently? Should we do things uh, to try and simplify and speed up the procedure? So less exposure for the patient in the cardiac cath lab or the operating room and do everything we can to get the patient uh, out of the hospital as quickly as possible. And then lastly, uh, germane to the issues with regards to anti restenotic therapies, should we be thinking about DCB in a case like this with provisional stenting, um, looking at uh, data from Gary today, I think that stenting is uh, certainly not, there's not a downside to that in a case like this. Or should we be thinking about drug looting stents uh, right up front? Now, another thing to talk about is, you know, what are the results in these really complex lesions? Gary has talked about the impact global uh, registry, which included the three uh, pre-specified imaging cohorts, the long lesion cohort, ISR cohort and CTO cohort. We did another analysis from this uh, global study, basically looking at the most complex lesions in this uh, global registry. This complex lesion analysis looked at patients who had lesions of 18 sonometers or more. And we retrospectively analyzed that group, looking at 12 month primary patency and 12 month safety composite endpoints. So this is a, uh, a cohort where this patient would have fallen into based on the lesion length that we've seen, or lesion length that we've seen in this case. So in the complex lesion analysis, we now have about two thirds of the lesions are de novo lesions, one third uh, restenotic. That includes non-stent restenosis as well as in-stent restenosis. The lesion length is now really long, 28.74 centimeters, and 70% of the lesions are chronic total occlusions, with about a third being moderately to severely calcified. If we look at the procedural uh, characteristics, we see that predilation was used in the majority of cases, post-dilation in about 45%. Not surprisingly, Provisional stenting was required in over 40% of these cases. Not surprising given the fact that these are 28 centimeter long uh, lesions with a high percentage of total occlusions. But the overall device and procedural success was remarkably high, 99% uh, or greater across the board. And if we look at the one year outcomes with regards to uh, primary patency and freedom from clinically driven target lesion revascularization, also remarkably good. Uh, less than one in 10 patients came back for an additional procedure within that 12 month time period. So I think this case fits nicely into that uh, data construct. Uh, getting back uh, to the case, uh, we chose a seven French uh, Balkan crossover sheath here just to allow for some additional options. And then uh, I elected to use uh, 18,000 platform to try and cross the seclusion. Uh, it's where treasure 12 wire with an 18,000 support catheter. We can see kind of an overlay of the uh, fluoroscopy roadmap on the left side of the screen. That's the micro catheter being advanced uh, over the guide wire. And then on the right side, we can see in this case, easily crossed uh, this CTO with the 18,000s uh, guide wire. It's always a little bit unpredictable up front as to how easy it's going to be to cross these occlusions. In this case, uh, relatively straightforward, 
and pretty high confidence level that this is an intraluminal crossing of the CTO. In this case, uh, because it was an easy to cross CTO, uh, I had to assume that there was a, a significant likelihood of thrombus, uh, subacute uh, thrombus as well as chronic thrombus. So I do like to debulk in these cases, particularly for the longer lesions and occlusions. For a softer lesion like this, I will commonly use uh, eczema laser. This is a 2.3 millimeter turbo leak catheter being advanced slowly through the proximal part of this lesion. And I like this approach just for the simplicity of it. For a uh, shorter lesion or a harder, uh, more fibrotic or calcified lesion, I'd be thinking about debulking with uh, excisional atherectomy using perhaps the Hawk 1 catheter. We can see now the result after a couple passes with the 2.3 millimeter laser. We have flow now through uh, the CTO uh, area, uh, but certainly a, not an optimal result yet. And then we went ahead and did pre dilatation, in this case with a four millimeter diameter balloon. And I continue to use that fluoroscopic landmark to allow us to, to get some sizing estimates, both in terms of the diameter of the vessel and appropriate diameter balloon to choose, uh, but also length. And we could see based on uh, the use of those two 15 centimeter long balloons that the lesion length was somewhere between uh, 25 and 30 centimeters, which also helps me in terms of the choice of the length of the drug coated balloon if we're going to use DCB. And we can see after pre-dilatation here that we actually have a pretty good result. We've got good flow through the SFA, uh, no uh, evidence of flow limiting dissection, but we do have at least uh, moderate areas of uh, recoil or renearing within the vessel. So we know we need to do something more here to optimize the result. And I think in terms of the treatment algorithm, I will still pre-dilate in the majority of cases. And then based on the result after that pre-dilatation, then the algorithm switches to either a drug-coated balloon algorithm or a drug-looting stent algorithm. If we get significant dissection that looks very uh, flow-limiting after pre-dilatation, then I start thinking about treating at least part of the lesion with a drug looting stent. But we've got an encouraging result so far. So again, uh, using the roadmap overlay, in this case chose a five millimeter diameter by 200 millimeter long impact admiral balloon. I knew that a 250 balloon was gonna come up a little bit short. So what chose the 200 100 millimeter balloon to start and then finished at the top with a uh, five millimeter diameter by an 80 millimeter long impact admiral. And the nice thing about using this fluoroscopic uh, roadmap overlay is you can ensure that there is no geographic miss. You can see that we have at least one to two centimeters of overlap, that we've completely covered the lesion with the drug coated balloon and have not left any areas treated with the pre dilatation balloon that are not treated with. Uh, drug eluting therapy. And then after uh, a three minute inflation with a drug coated balloon, we can see a really nice angiographic result, good flow through the vessel and good flow uh, distally with no evidence of distal embolization. And I will say that we did not use distal embolic protection in this case. I don't usually use uh, embolic protection when I use laser, particularly if I'm just using the turbo elite catheters. And that also helps simplify the procedure and helps management of costs to a certain degree. So just a refresher, here is the pre-intervention angiogram on the left side, and then post uh, DCB on the right side of the screen. So this patient was treated roughly about uh, two weeks ago.
Now there was that lesion in the right external iliac artery that we showed early on. So at the end of the case, we went ahead and uh, treated that nice focal lesion in the external iliac artery with a short self-expanding nitinol stent to help finish things off. There were no complications related to the procedure. I think one of the nice things with this approach is we avoided a permanent metallic endoprosthesis in the superficial femoral artery. Post-intervention, her ABI is normalized bilaterally. She's had early uh, good relief of her claudication symptoms. And follow-up duplex is scheduled. Uh, clearly, this is a higher-risk patient for restenosis based on her diabetic status and long uh, SFA lesion with occlusion. So she will need a routine uh, surveillance by duplex. I think uh, probably worthy of discussion in the COVID era, how you do your duplex follow-up. We've modified our approach a little bit, kind of shortening the, and simplifying the duplex examination to try and increase the uh, safety for our ultrasound uh, technologists. And so with that, I'll stop and uh, I think open things up to discussion. So great presentation, John. I mean, it shows you what we can do these days with the right technology. I mean. Think back to the days where we had plain balloon angioplasty or just bare metal stents trying to take care of that, uh, you know, expected restenosis rates would have been probably 60 to 80 percent even at a year. So you're getting, you know, much better results now with drug technology. It really has changed the patient outcomes and things like that. How do you decide these days if you now that you'll know that you could spot stent and not really adversely affect your outcomes very much. How will you decide whether you're going to athrectomize ahead of time or just say, hey, I'm going to, if I, if I need to spot stent, I'll spot stent? Yeah, that's a really great question because most of the data we showed today really is just straight up drug coated boon angioplasty without uh, any use of debulking or atherectomy devices prior to the DCB. Um, I, though, would like to try and reduce that provisional stent rate as much as possible. And I think we probably can do that by debulking some of these lesions up front. And I think your choice of debulking a device depends a lot on your own ex individual experience and comfort levels with these devices. You know, I think there's an algorithm for treating softer or thrombotic lesions and a different algorithm for treating the more heavily calcified or fibrotic lesions in terms of the choice of the device. Uh, but I think for me, it's a, it's a decision to try and further reduce the need for, for provisional stenting, although I think we've shown that the data is, is okay with provisional stenting, but it'd be nice to uh, minimize that still as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. I think especially those full metal jackets, you know, we, we really still don't want to do that if we can right. really, really change it. A lot. I mean, what a, I mean, that lesion, what a complex lesion that fit about every category you could want. Um, and so, I mean, what a great outcome. We really appreciate that. Pete, do you have any uh, questions on the case? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a great case uh, from especially from a standpoint of the fact that it touched on so many of the things that we uh, have talked about today. Um, and just kind of thinking through um, you know, what's your other alternative if you don't use a drug delivery strategy in somebody like this, you know, to put a bare, a bare metal prosthesis over that kind of length, especially in a woman with a long uh, lesion and a smoking history and a, uh, you know, she's in a, a subgroup of patients with a little bit smaller arteries for example, that don't get great results with stents or especially long stents. It's hard to picture really what else you're going to do here that you could hope is still going to be open, you know, a couple years down the road, um, you know, other, other than a bypass, which, you know, most people don't want that as their first choice. They, they want that as their last choice. And especially, I think you mentioned the COVID era, um, Last thing I want to do is bring somebody in the hospital for days to a week um, in, the, in the current environment. I think that current environment, although it's changing because the number of patients with COVID is decreasing, our precautions are still at a very high level and have to stay at a high level until we have either better treatments or better 
uh, prevention, uh, like, uh, you know, vaccine or, or however we do it uh, for prevention. So I thought, yeah, it was really well handled. Tell me, did that narrow bifurcation affect you much during the procedure or, or was it was it just easy to maneuver over that? Actually, it was turned out to be surprisingly easy. Uh, two things were surprisingly easy. One was the managing the bifurcation, and the other was crossing the CTO. It was surprisingly easy to get through there, as we showed with that uh, 18,000 Skywire. So every now and then, it turns out to be easier than you expected. Yeah, yeah. Do you, so do you have any kind of rule of thumb, John, for when it's, quotes too easy to cross an occlusion? It always yeah, makes me that, nervous if it's too easy. Yeah, yeah I think in, it's kind of a mixed blessing, right? So when the wire crosses that easy, then you're sort of immediately thinking, uh-oh, there's going to be some fresh thrombus here, and there's probably a higher risk of uh, distal embolization. And that's frankly why I decided to use the kind of laser up front to try and debulk any uh, more fresher thrombus that might be there. And then there's that second decision about whether to use embolic protection device or not. I didn't in this case, but um, it would not have been unwise to do that. Yeah. Well, I think the laser, as you say, it does confer a slight advantage in that setting where you think there could be uh, thrombus in that it, it probably evaporates the um, you know some of the uh, thrombotic material um, so so then you, this idea of you know kind of weighing you know whether to use a, a embolic protection device that that makes sense and I, I heard you give that little intonation in your thought process of uh, you know that you had been through that algorithm in your head as the case was unfolding yeah right. pretty good excellent case well, I think this is a great um, segue to get off in that we've now looked at drug-coated balloons and in complex lesions. We've seen that uh, bailout stenting doesn't seem to have any long-term downsides. We've seen that the safety concerns and the proper perspective for that, given the increasing data sets that we're getting, and then through an expert's hands, how to handle these complex lesions with the different technologies and how complementary they can be. Very much appreciate you guys. Look forward to making sure that you're safe to continue to help these patients. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, John.